this, God. Help us to be a fiery church, God. Lord, help us to be a church that is on fire for you, God. Help us to be a fire that, a church that is on fire for your word, a church that is on fire for your presence, a church that is on fire for your service, God. Show me your heart. Show me your way. Show me your glory. Lord, help these hands to be hands that work miracles. Help this voice to be one that shows love. Help these actions to be one that shows love, God. Have, a, have your way in our lives, Father. God, I pray right now, Lord, that you would totally and utterly smash this church to pieces, Lord. Lord, in, in sake of your glory, in sake of for your like for your majesty, Lord. Help us to be a people after you, God. Help us to be a praying people, God. Lord, help us to get more people showing up on a on a Monday to Thursday morning for a half an hour of prayer. It's not an awful lot. Help us to be a people that want to pray. Help us to be a people that want to meet together. Help us to be a people that want to see you in amongst us and see you in the streets and see you in our family. Help us to be a people who go home and talk about you, God. Help us to be people that go to work and talk about you, God. We really want to see your glory. Make us fiery God make us a fiery church help us to be that sort of church that people go whenever you go there's just a bit wild because Lord I want to see wild I want to see fantastico I want to see I want to see amazing things happen here God I don't want to just be bland normal Christians I want to be I want to be like seeing things in the spirit I want to be seeing things of your glory I want to be seeing things of your majesty and your miracles and your healing in the streets God Jesus have your way have your way in us Father help us to know your presence and know your closeness help us to know your glory Jesus, we need you so bad. Show us your heart. Show us your way. Show us your glory uh, in Ignite Church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Grab a seat, folks. In Jesus' name, that's good news. Woo! (laughs) Happy days. Hello, Jane. You're right, Jane. Happy days. So we're um, we're looking at we're just starting a new series. Are we up for a new series of talks? Um, uh, it didn't sound like did, did I just not give you time to say yes, or was you just not interested? Yes, yes excellent, lovely. We're going to start a new series of talks, um, and we're going to be looking at um, conversations with Jesus, particularly in the Gospel of John, to get us started with. If that's, if that's all right, oh, we've been doing um, we've been doing uh, Jesus' words in Matthew in our morning devotions for ages. Um, although we haven't done morning devotions for a while, uh, and so we're uh, and so. So we will get back to that. We will get back to that some Zoom morning devotions and stuff like that. I just need a few more volunteers for library stuff. So if you're up for being a librarian on Thursday mornings, then give us a shout. That would be really good news, okay? Um, But yes, we're going to be going into conversations with Jesus from the Gospel of John. And you might go, why from the Gospel of John, Pastor? Why not from the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, or Luke? Well, the truth is that actually Jesus seems to do a whole lot more talking and different conversations in the Gospel of John. And not only that, but also the conversations seem to be quite spiritual. Has anyone else noticed that? The conversations in John seem to be a little bit more spiritual and Jesus seems to have actual conversations. Whereas in the other ones, he seems to be preaching or he seems to be like speaking and uh, or giving commands or stuff like that. You know, he seems to be more sort of statements rather than convo. And it's really important today, church, that first of all, before we even start our sermon series, that I tell you that it's important that you have conversations with Jesus. Yeah? It's important that you have conversations with Jesus, um, mostly because that's what prayer is. Prayer isn't a shopping list of things that you need, and prayer isn't, like, sometimes it can be just sitting there and chilling out and monging out in the presence of God. I love a bit of that, in all honesty. I love a bit of that. But from time to time, it's important that we have a conversation with Jesus. And so sometimes on a Tuesday night, one of the things, one of the practices that we do uh, in terms of our prayer life and being more prophetic in our prayer life is we will sit down and we will just have a moment where we chill out in his presence. And I'll say to folks, what I want you to do is just allow your brain just to not switch off, but just to chill out for a moment, you know, like let your, let your mind stop worrying about the things of the world and what you're going to have for dinner when you get home and all that sort of stuff. Stop worrying about all that stuff and then just, you know, you might even have a scripture in mind, you know, just think of a scripture or think of a question that you want to ask Jesus and then allow him to take your thoughts on a journey through the spiritual stuff, right? Yeah? And so what happens is he sort of takes you on this journey. Does anyone else have this? I love delivering flyers through people's doors. I love doing that. Do you know why I love doing that? Because the whole time it's so menial, you don't have to think about going like this, do you? You don't have to think about it. So the whole time I'm there just going, Jesus, what do you think about 
such and such a thing. Or what do you think about this thing over here? What do you think about, you know, and I remember one day when I was, um, when I was uh, working for Spencer Contact before I was a pastor, before I even went to Bible college. And, uh, and I was stood there and I was painting some racking, you know. What's that, amorite? Is that what it's called? Stops it from rusting. I was painting the racking with some amorite. And as I'm painting, um, the Lord Jesus starts a conversation with me. And he turns around and says, what do you think I meant when I said it is finished on the cross? And I was like, huh, really interesting question, Jesus. You know, so I start thinking, I wonder what it means. And then I'm having this sort of like conversation with him. I'm letting my mind go all over the place. And then my, one of my elders, who was also my boss, came over and said, hey, Darren, how are you doing? And what sort of day are you having? I said, I'm having a conversation with Jesus. He said, oh, what about? I said, I'm just like Jesus just asked me what he meant by... Um, it is finished on the cross. And he said, oh, that's really interesting. And so we started having a conversation together with Jesus. You know, I'd call that a prophetic conversation. You know, I'd call that a prophetic conversation. It's the two of us together alongside Jesus and Holy Spirit having a conversation about things that are spiritual. And it was a wonderful time that we had together. And we sort of come to a conclusion. I won't tell you the conclusion because I want to get on with my sermon. Is that all right? Um, so we could talk about that another day. In fact, I think me and, uh, and Jason started having a, a bit of a theological conversation the other day. I thought, Tuesday night on the old Zoom roofing. Do you remember in here? And uh, do you remember that? Yeah, cool. And, uh, and <laughs> I thought for a second he didn't remember what I was going to say. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, but we started having a theological conversation. I had to say to him, you know what? I think we need to chill out and I need to go home. It's almost nine o'clock. So we need to go home and we'll have a conversation another day. Uh, let's have this conversation another day. Is that all right? We're going to read from John chapter one. Are we up for it? Yeah. Happy days. Lovely. That's at least four of us. Okay. So. Jesus meets a fellow called Nathaniel, and it's, uh, you can have a look at this in John chapter 1, verse 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel come into him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, So you see there's some dialogue, isn't there, yeah? A bit of dialogue. Jesus said to him, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Yeah? Can you imagine that? Jesus saw me before he knew me, before he came and met me, yeah? Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel, yeah? Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe you will see greater things than these? And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. What is going on? That's a really interesting thing, isn't it? So Jesus turns around to Nathaniel, and essentially Nathaniel's just meeting him for the first time. They're standing uh, in a field or something, or maybe even, a, even in the streets. Who knows where they are, but they're not in church, right? So the first thing you need to know today is sometimes Jesus can have a conversation with you outside of church. Isn't that good news? Yes, come on. You don't always have to come to church to have a conversation. However... However, who knows that coming to church is always the best place to find Jesus? Yeah? Come on, it is, isn't it, right? Because I've, I've found, I've been a Christian now for 15 years. I've found if I am a little bit dry out there, I can come in here and get soaked. Yeah? That's what I've found over the years. If I'm a little bit dry out there, if I'm a little bit dry at home, I can come to church and my friends and family around me and my Christian family, they can lift me up a bit and help me to find a moment of glory and I can get soaked all over again. So number one, thing number one, a little bit of information, you know, a little bit of a detour in my sermon. Number one, Jesus can meet you and wants to have conversations with you outside of church. That's really important. What's also really, really important that you get to hear today is that in church is a special place where you can meet with Jesus in other ways too. And it's also important, the Bible does say, that us guys being near each other makes us stronger. Okay? Hebrews says that we shouldn't give up on meeting together. It's really important that we come together, that we gather. Gathering is a really important part of the kingdom of God. It happens over and over again. There are no individuals in the Bible. It's always community. So Jesus can talk to you and wants to talk to you and wants to have a conversation outside of church, but he really wants you in church. Isn't that good news? Yeah? Is that okay? Cool. Okay, so that's the first point that we see. So Jesus meets Nathaniel outside of church and then is like, hey, I saw you. No, so the first thing is, he says, he says, 
You are a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. It's interesting. We can talk about that theology another day, but it's just interesting, right? Essentially, he prophesies. So he has a prophetic conversation with Nathaniel. Nathaniel turns around and says, how do you know who I am? And he says, I saw you under the fig tree, right? All good stuff. And then he says this wonderful and weird thing where he says, essentially, do you believe because I've said this prophecy to you? Do you believe because I've had a word of knowledge for you? The obvious answer is, well, yeah, I guess so. You would, wouldn't you? You, You'd believe a little bit more, wouldn't you? So on Tuesday nights, what we've been doing is we've been focusing on words of knowledge, more so in our church, so that we can bring better words of knowledge. We want to bring clearer, more clarity to our words of knowledge so that we can learn a bit more about that. Really important stuff, okay? Because if you're a Christian, you should eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, of which prophecy is the one that you should seek more than all the others, apparently, yeah? That's what the Bible says. So it comes out of a word of knowledge. Now do you believe? The obvious answer is yes, okay? Cool. In that case, you will see greater things than these. In fact, you're going to see you're going to see the heavens open and angels are going to ascend and descend upon the son of man. Jesus is talking about himself. You're going to see angels coming to me and going away from me. You're going to see that, okay? Really cool. Yeah? Anyone else want to see angels? I've always been a bit funky with angels, if I'm honest. Um, I I meet lots of people. I I saw, where was I? I was preaching once on a, I think it was Sunday morning down in Bootham, uh, down in Moreland Community Centre. And uh, and this young lady came up to me after the service and she said, Darren, I saw this ginormous angel stood behind you. And I thought, I didn't. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and then, uh, and then I was at this conference once, and then this this guy who's a little bit interesting. Um, let's see what I did there. Um, this guy who's a little bit interesting came up to me and said, "Oh, there's angels all around the building." And I thought, you know what? I didn't see one. <laughs> you know, and uh, and if, if if I'm totally honest, there's a little bit of me that goes, like, I'm up for it. You know, I'm up for it. I'm up for seeing angels. I might even be up for seeing demons. Um, and then cast them out, you know, get out of my sight, you sicko. Um, you know, I might be up for some of that stuff, right? I'm, I, I think I'm okay with that. But then when someone a bit like wispy comes along, right? And uh, <laughs> wispy, you know, like, I saw an angel. And I'm like, I'm like, nice, but you see an angel everywhere you go. And I just, I just struggle to connect with that, you know? However... However, I'm also like, well, maybe they're telling the truth. Maybe they did see an angel, you know? And the truth is that, that Jesus promises this to Nathaniel, right? And then you see a little bit later in the scriptures that Stephen sees the heavens open, right? Yeah, as he's about to die. And then, and then Paul sees the heavens open, right? Paul goes into a place that he calls the third heaven. Now, like, we could talk about that all day long. We don't even... The third heaven, there's three of them. Okay, mate, all right, let's dig into that. If that doesn't make you want to read your words some more, then I don't know what will, you know what I mean? But it's, who knows? Anyway, um, I know, but we're not going to go into it right now. Uh, you know what I mean? So, 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 but here's the point, right? So Paul sees like heaven open, right? And then there's this guy called John who writes this book called Revelation. It's one big fat revelation. Um, just to note, it's not Revelations, it's Revelation, okay? For those of you guys who know your Bible and don't know your Bible, it's not Revelations, it's Revelation. It's one big revelation of what's going on in heaven. Um, you might even suggest that it all happens in one big vision, right? Mm, yeah, cool. Anyway, yeah, yeah, cool. You're okay with that? Lovely. And in that revelation, he is once again caught up into the heavenly realm, right? And so what we see is we see Jesus say, Nathaniel, you're going to see angels. You're going to see heaven open. And then Stephen later on sees heaven open. Paul sees heaven open. And then on top of that, young John sees heaven open. On top of that, on top of that, we also see these moments. Has anyone ever heard of Jacob's ladder? You know Jacob's ladder? You know, yeah, Jacob's ladder. Jacob, uh, he's a guy from right back, right, right, right back to the very beginnings of the people of Israel. In fact, Jacob became Israel. That's his name. Um, and so Jacob has this moment where he's in a place called Bethel. Now, does anyone know what Bethel means? House of, come on, mate. House of God. It's quite obvious. Come on. Um, so Bethel, the house of God. The house of God. When Jacob was asleep in the house of God, God gave him a vision. 
Okay, and God gave him a vision of angels ascending and descending to heaven. Okay, now isn't it interesting? Number one, that is in the house of God where Jacob saw the angels going up and down and the heavens open, right? It was in the presence of God that John fell down, right? Yeah, in the presence of God. It says that he was in the spirit and then this happened, right? He fell down as though, as though dead, okay? Interesting. Has anyone ever seen someone fall over in church and you think, mm, what's that all about, right? Yeah, you, yeah you've, that happened to you a few times, did it? Happened to me a couple of times. Well, you know, someone falls over in church and you're thinking, what are they doing? That's a bit funky, isn't it? I don't know if I like that. Um, I was one of those folks. I saw, I saw someone falling over in church and I thought, what a weirdo. Like, what are you doing there, mate? Does everyone fall over? Is that what happens? And I get asked this question all the time. You know, when people fall over in church, there's a couple of things that are happening. Number one, they're overwhelmed with all sorts of stuff that God is doing in them, okay? And you know when, you know when you're a bit overwhelmed, sometimes you feel a bit dizzy, yeah? And then because... Somewhere, somewhere along the lines, someone read that John fell over. Maybe some folks probably thought, you know, maybe they got down and knelt down. Or John just seems to collapse in a heap as though dead, right? Anyway, and so over time, what's happened is, in our culture as Pentecostals, someone stood behind someone expecting this to happen, right? And then, it, and then they f- fell over into their arms, right? And then that became like this new thing. I was once, um, I was once uh, hearing a story about this fellow in Africa who, um, who was preaching one day. And, uh, and all of a sudden, um, uh, like he's preaching over and over again in this church. And then all of a sudden, one day he hurt his leg, right? And, uh, and then that week he came into church like hobbling, you know, so he had a bit of a hobble as he was walking. And, um, and uh, on the stage, as he was preaching that day, suddenly everyone got tongues and stuff, you know, and, 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 and his leg went like this, you know. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, that became like the day that, you know, because his leg went like this, um, the Holy Spirit moves, right? So then every week his leg's going like this, you know, even after he's totally healed and his leg's all right. And then guess what happens? Everyone else starts, Whoa! you know, and then, you know, that's like the new thing. That's a new culture in the Pentecostal church. Everyone wobbling their leg as the Holy Spirit comes, right? Um, here's the thing. We don't want to be a cultural um, manifestation, do we? We want to be a spirit manifestation. But the spirit seems to do something weird in that space. I believe that when people are a bit overwhelmed, And when they're a little bit, the Bible says, doesn't it? It says, don't get drunk on wine, but get drunk on the Holy Spirit, right? Does anyone else ever fall over when they're drunk? Yeah, before, okay, I mean, not not do you still fall over when you were drunk? I mean, like, before you was a Christian, you know, when you weren't a Christian, you got drunk every week. Did anyone used to fall over? Um, like I've seen people fall over. Um, I've seen people fall over and bang their heads off curbs and stuff. You know, like stupid, right? Um, I've seen people doing that when they're not drunk as well. Um, but do you know what I mean? Like, he, here's my point, right? In that moment, it's like something happens. Okay, I just wanted to explain that and just try and like make that okay. Because if it does happen here at any point, you'll go, "Oh yeah, they they was drunk in the spirit." Um, I often talk about Malcolm. Sorry, this is a proper detour from the Word of God. Um, I often talk about Malcolm. Um, when we went to Birmingham, do you remember that day, Malcolm, and you had to be carried out um, because you were drunkard in the spirit? Right? It's brilliant. Um, here's my point. Here's my point. Let's get back to the sermon. Jesus says to Nathaniel, "You will see the heavens open." Angels will go up and down. Jacob has a moment where angels go up and down. Elisha has... Has anyone heard the story of Elisha where um, Elisha's servant is told to go out and, and check, see what's going on. And then, uh, and then there's like, you know, and then he gets all upset because there's like armies and armies like surrounding them and, and they're going to like get battered by this massive army. And uh, because um, Elisha's been like speaking the word of God. People don't like it when you speak the word of God, you know. And so Elisha says, don't worry, it's going to be all right. It can be all right, mate. We'll be all right on a night, you know. And then, uh, and then the, the servant's like, "No, we're gonna die, right? We're gonna die." And so Elisha's convinced, and so eventually he prays this prayer: "God, would you open his eyes, my servant's eyes, right?" And so he opens his. God opens the servant's spiritual eyes, and suddenly the servant can see around him an army of angels that is far like able to beat the army that's coming against them and the truth is that sometimes we have our eyes open but we don't have our spiritual eyes open and the truth is that this is okay for all of us to experience and that we should at times be able to connect with heaven on a different level than just a little funky feeling yeah 
Because I don't want to be led by my feelings, do I? Why? Because if I'm led by my feelings, then one day I feel good and I want to come into God's presence and I want to have a lovely time and I want to get smashed in his spirit and I want to grow a little bit. You know, I want to, I want to move forward in my faith today because I'm feeling good, right? But how about the day when you're feeling duff? Yeah? And then your feelings do what? They discourage you from growing and they discourage you from going and they discourage you from doing the things of God that you're meant to be doing, right? Your feelings do that. So I want to be a Christian who's not going to be all focused on my feelings and that my feelings dis- uh, like dictate what I'm going to do with my life. Yeah? So if I feel a little bit down on Sunday, guess what? I'm still rocking up. In fact, um, sorry, Sophie. Um, Sophie was feeling poorly this week and didn't go to work, I know. And a lot of people would do that, wouldn't they? Yeah? I'm like, you know what? When I'm feeling poorly, I still rock up anyway. Because I don't want my feelings to... And you might go, yeah, but I was mad sick, right? Yeah. Like, you know, there's toilets at work as well. You can puke in there. Anyway, um, I'm kidding, obviously. Everyone's not as rough as me, you know? Some of us are just a bit more like... I'm a bit like that. I just don't like missing days off work. You know, in fact, I felt a bit rough yesterday because I had the flu jab. You know that flu jabby thing? Everyone's been saying... No, no, I had, a, I had a flu thingy, right? And, and, and everyone's going, oh, Darren, you're going to feel really rough. You're going to feel really rough. So I had this flu jab, and then I'm like, I'm like starting to feel a little bit drowsy and a little bit like, you know, a bit warm. You know, you do, don't you, right? And my arm's aching like mad. And Laura's like, can we go and have a meal? I'm like, yeah, I'll do anything right now to not be sitting on my couch feeling duff. You know what I mean? So I get up and start doing stuff. We went to the garden centre. I know, yeah. And we went, we went to Pennells because it was a 20 per, 20% off opening day on a Christmas thing. I know. Come on. We bought a little bauble. We buy a bauble every year. You know what I mean? So we, we bought a little pretty bauble. I got a caravan. Um, I know. A caravan bauble. You want one of them, don't you? Only 90 quid. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm, ki- I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You know? And, and, then, and then, we, then we had a little look around. We bought some plants. About. I bought a climbing rose to climb over the front of my new house and make it look pretty. You know what I mean? And, and I just went out and did some stuff. I got in about, I don't know, four or five o'clock or something. And then guess what I did? I then started like making the rest of my cheesecake. Has anyone seen my cheesecake? Oh, come on. If you're not on social media, come on. But I've made a massive cheesecake. It's like that deep. Like it's massive. And uh, it's got like, I crushed some raspberries and stuff on top of it, some strawberries and that, you know, and then I put little whole strawberries. It's amazing. And then I've already eaten half of it. Um, you know, hence this bad boy today. Um, you know, anyway. Anyway. I don't want to be led by my feelings, you know? Because when I'm feeling duff, guess what? I'm going to start acting duff. And guess what happens when you act duff? You upset people and then your feelings get worse, right? Instead, I want to be led by my sight and not just any sight, but I want to be led by my spiritual sight. I want to be led by the word of God, you know? I want to be led by Jesus and his presence. I want to be led by my faith today, you know? I want to be led by my faith. So when I'm feeling rough today, I remember that tomorrow's coming and he'll turn turn my morning into dancing and he'll turn my ashes into beauty and I'll become a little bit better tomorrow because today I might feel a bit deaf, but if I just see this bad boy out, then I'll be feeling all right tomorrow. But feeling duff today doesn't mean I stop life, right? Feeling duff today means I don't just stop. It means that I don't just give up. It means that I still come to church on Sunday. And I know I'm talking about coming to church on Sunday a lot at the moment. But you know what? I think it's really important. I did go through a time of thinking it's not that important. I think I had a conversation with you the other day, didn't I, John? Having this, having this sort of thing of, you know, maybe actually it's all about discipleship and midweek discipleship. But what I've come to find is that Sunday is the boost you need to keep on walking with Jesus on a, on a midweek, you know? And so over the last three years, I've not been big on Sundays. I've just not done it. I've not said about you need to turn up to church on Sundays. I've not highlighted Sundays. I've not, I've not been one of them pastors who every Saturday without fail puts up a sign of a picture of an empty church saying, we're ready for you. <laughs> you know, I've just not done it, you know? I've just not been that person. Why? Because I, I didn't want Sundays to be everything. Because if you make Sundays everything, then guess what happens? On Monday, because we're not in church, guess what happens? I turn into a moron. And so I've been big on focusing on Monday and I've been doing Mondays for a long time now and I've been focusing on Monday but guess what when people don't rock up on Sunday they don't rock up on Monday either 
And so I've been focusing on Sundays. Uh, not, I've been not focusing on Sundays at all. But let me tell you this. I think it's about time that we started focusing on Sundays a little bit more. And I think that the Lord showed me that. And we all go on these journeys. You know, Rob Bell once wrote a book called Love Wins. He really regrets it. Um, you know, um, because there's a load of heresy in it. Um, so, but it was a journey that he was on. It was a journey that he was on. And today, you may not be on a journey at all. Maybe you've stopped your journey and you've stopped because you feel a bit duff. You've stopped because, you know, um, someone upset you in church and made your feelings do something else. Anyone else do that? Oh, someone at church said something about me. According to Aunt Ethel, <laughs> right? Yeah, Aunt Ethel said that Jimmy said that I could have done with some deodorant today, and so I'm never going to church again. <laughs> yeah, come on, who who hasn't done that? Anyone not done that? I, I've never done that. I've I've never skipped church because someone said I smell. I just put some deodorant on, you know. Um, come on, but let me tell you this: so many people leave church or take holidays from church or just don't come to church because, you, you, oh mate, I, I said it the other week, didn't I? Someone's bathing the kids on a Sunday morning. I'm like, oh my days, of all the times you could bathe the kids, why Sunday? Of all the times you could go shopping, why Sunday? Of all the times that you can like, invite your family around, why Sunday? Why Sunday? It's the one day, it's the one day of the week where we get to come together and be together and be the people of God and... With any luck, as we're in Bethel, the house of God, just for a moment, we might see the heavens opened and angels doing funky things. And we might encounter God in a new way. Right? We might. And what's more, I've come to find that if we make ourselves a people of encounter, that stuff happens more often. And although some of it might be culture... Some of it might be culture. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Come on, I'm going to do that every week. Come on. Although some of it might be culture. Hallelujah. Right? I've come to find that culture often helps the flow. Because if we don't have a culture of response, if we don't have a culture of encounter, then what happens is everyone just stops responding and stops encountering. Because at some point, you've got to get yourself out there. You've got to have someone lay their hands on you. You've got to have a moment where you're up in the air and you're flying about and you feel like you could beast another five weeks and go in a ring again with Mike Tyson or the devil or whatever else. You need that. And unless you start being a people of encounter and response we're not going to see some of that stuff happening why because once you're out of the habit of responding and encountering do you know what happens when it's actually time to respond and encounter you go oh it feels awkward now it feels awkward now i don't think i can be the first one up now you know i don't think i can respond again now because it just feels weird right does anyone know what I'm talking about? You all know what I'm talking about because for years we were a, a church of response and encounter, weren't we? We've been in that church forever. Then lockdown happened and everyone got out of the habit and then all of a sudden it's like, it's like we're just not doing it. And then what happens is people start dropping off. And do you know why they drop off? It's because they have not encountered the Lord and why haven't they encountered the Lord? Well, because in that moment where they were told it's time to respond, it's time to have our eyes opened, it's time to do encounter together, they went, oh, it feels a bit weird. It feels a bit weird. I don't want Aunt Ethel telling everyone that I fell over in church or something. Eh? <laughs> right? And so we don't respond. And then we don't encounter. And then what's our faith made up of? Because I promise you this, you're not all reading your Bibles at home either. How do I know that? How do I know you're not reading your Bibles at home? Because when you encounter God, you get addicted to encountering God. And if you're not reading this at home, then you're not going to be encountering him at home. Okay? And so you're going to get dry. You're going to get sore. Your faith's going to go down the pan. And then guess what happens? 
life starts to look a bit more mucky on Facebook. Life starts to look a bit more mucky on Sundays and you never rock up. All of a sudden, everyone's ill. No one's really ill. I just couldn't be bothered today. And the reason I couldn't be bothered is because I don't see value in it. And why don't I see value in it? Because I've not been encountering him. And if we're not a church of encounter, then let me tell you this. We're not a church at all. Because it is not about what we know. It's about who we know. It's not about what we know. It's about who we know. And you can study and you can tell me all of the different things about all of the theologies and all those other things. And people try, like, it's great in our church. New people come along and they try and teach me everything. I'm like, I've heard it all. Malcolm, you've heard it all, right? John, you've heard it all, right? Been around long enough. You've pretty much heard everything, right? You've heard everything that humans have to offer, right? And yourselves, you've been around a little while, haven't you? Not, not quite as long as Malcolm, no, right? He's been around a really long time. But you get to the point where you've theologically encountered everything. And all that's left now is encounters with him. And if that dries up, then guess what? Faith dries up too. We need to be a people of encounter. We need to be a people who have our eyes open. Who can see the heavens open before them. Who can see the spiritual things that are happening both in this room, out there in the streets, in our living rooms. You know what? Can I be really honest with you? Can I be really uh, super honest? I get intrusive thoughts reasonably regular because um, I'm a broken, broken, I'm a broken vessel, everyone. I know. Very cliche. I'm a broken vessel. I get intrusive thoughts. I was really tired this week and I had this intrusive thought. And the intrusive thought um, was about taking my voice away. And I suddenly realized that that's not my hurt speaking. The devil literally wants to take away my voice. And I suddenly realized that, you know what? I think I'm in a spiritual battle. And I think that God is on my side and that he's enlightening me and opening my eyes to the fact that the devil, maybe not the devil, but a devil, (laughs) wants to take away my voice. Why? Because that's the thing that glorifies God the most, right? Let me tell you, my tattoos don't. My hair's looking pretty good today, but that doesn't glorify God, you know? My voice does more for God than what most of my other stuff does, right? Right? And so when I get an intrusive thought this week of removing my voice, I'm like, suddenly the penny drops. The devil isn't even bothered about my life just now. He's bothered about my ministry. Crazy, right? Crazy. My spiritual eyes just became open to that. Why? Because I'm a person of encounter. And I pray consistently, God, open my eyes. God, be with me. When was the last time you confessed to God? When was the last time you confessed? I confess all the time. I confess every day. I confess every day. I've got so much to confess. Not to you guys today, but, you know, to God. When was the last time you confessed? When was the last time you sat down and got into this thing? When was the last time you really desired him? We sang a song earlier on. Fire fall down. Open my heart. Open my... What is it? What's the words again? Can we get them up on the screen? Show me your heart. There you go. Show me. Show me. There we go. Show me your heart, right? Not open my heart. Show me your heart, right? Show me your heart. Show me your way. Show me your glory. I love that song, Show Me Your Glory. Brilliant song. I see a cloud and I rush in. I have had two amazing experiences with Jesus that were a whole nother level. Most of you guys probably would have heard me speak about these before. 
One was on the way home from Tewkesbury. I went to Tewkesbury uh, to do my first year of Bible college. Uh, did a little thing at a church there. And, and one Tuesday night we were praying, or rather I was praying, and, uh, and all of a sudden I opened my eyes because I was the only, only one in the building. I got a, bit, got a bit teary. I was on my knees, you know, just me and Jesus. I was on my knees crying and all of a sudden I noticed that... <laughs> I heard a little noise, so I opened my eyes, and there's a guy literally sat on a chair next to me. There's a whole room like this, massive room, tw- probably three times size, full of chairs, and he chose to sit right next to the chair where I was sitting there, bawling my eyes out, kneeling, crying. What a weirdo. Anyway, on the way home that night, the presence carried on, and uh, I was driving at the M5 back towards Bible College, and, and suddenly I felt the presence of God so thick that I closed my eyes as I was going at the M5, and uh, started praying. And uh, it was so, so real to me that I was convinced that Jesus was actually in the car. I mean, you know when you can feel like the presence of someone, like there's an actual physical person there with you? And it felt like that. So I was like, if I open my eyes now, Jesus, please let it be you. And so I opened my eyes and sat next to me in a passenger seat was a figure of a man wearing what you could only describe as, you know, Jesus' robes and stuff from the Jesus of Nazareth film, you know? Like a shadow, sort of more than a shadow, but not quite fully there. Do you know, you know what I mean? I was like, ah, oh, it's Jesus. So I closed my eyes again and carried on praying and driving. Took a little eye open every now and again just to make sure I was still going at the M5. <laughs> I know, I know. Didn't go over 70. Yeah. I was just overwhelmed. First time I ever spoke in tongues proper, I was going around the mountain. That camera's just gone off. Um, I was just uh, going around the mountain. Um, <laughs> at Bible College and I... I was worshiping to Bethel's album, and um, and again the presence was so true, so thick. I had a bunch of students in a car with me. He was on the way back from a youth club, and um, and it was just so proper, you know. And I, and I, I ran out of words to sing, you know. When you run out of English, so I started speaking in tongues. First time I ever spoken in tongues, you know. And my body went boof, and it was such an encounter that I drive around a mountain twice more in a car with the students in. They were like, we're going we're gonna to stop yet. We're going to stop yet. I was like, no, Jesus is here. We're not getting out. <laughs> we're never going to stop. There's another encounter which I had at Birchwood. And uh, Liam was there and a couple of guys were there. And we were just worshipping and had hands up in the air. You could pretty much touch the ceiling because it was so low. The room was so small and it was just like, there's just like four or five of us or something. I was worshipping and worshipping and worshipping. Giving, giving it my all like I do every Sunday, right? You know, I give it my all every Sunday. Yeah, because I'm a person of encounter. I don't want to give him a little bit of my praise. I want to give him every last bit of it, you know. I want to totally and utterly praise him. I don't want to go home feeling like, Jesus, I could have given you more. You know what I mean? So I was just giving it my all. And um, and because I really worship him, you know. I don't just like him; I worship him. You know. You ever worshipped anyone before? Like, I worship that guy. Come on. And so I was worshiping, and then uh, I felt like this arm come round me and like ran back at me and touched my shoulder, and I was like, "What the heck?" So I thought there was something wrong, and that Liam had something wrong with the tech because I had my eyes closed. So I turned to my left. Liam, are you all right? And Liam's like over there on the tech. And, he, and he, he saw my face and he thought that there was something wrong. There, there wasn't something wrong, there was something really right. Because if Liam's over there, then that must have been someone else, right? And there's no physical body there. <laughs> Who was it? Liam can confirm, he didn't see anyone. I say it's Jesus. I say it's Jesus. I pray again, Lord, open my eyes, open my eyes, open my eyes. I want to see the angels ascending and descending. But I don't just want to see angels, God. I want to see the Son of Man. I want to see Jesus. Come on, let's stand together. If this is your prayer, then why don't you put your hands on your eyes, man? Like, yeah, come on. Jesus, I want to see you. Jesus, I want to know you. Jesus, I want to see the angels ascending and descending on you. I'm not so bothered about the rest of everything that's going on. I don't care about angels standing around the hall whilst we worship. I don't care about angels standing behind me whilst I preach. I just want to see you, Jesus. The angels are secondary. I want to see heaven open. I want to see the Son of Man sat next to the, the, next to the Father. I want to see you guys. I want to see you. I want to know you. I want to, I want to see you in my life today. I want to see you in my life today. I want to be a person of encounter I want this to be a church of encounter and response. Jesus.
Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Give me a fresh encounter today. Lord, we need you. It's not being a second-rate Christian to not see Jesus. It's not being a second-rate Christian to not have conversations with Jesus. I might argue it's, if you don't see then maybe you're not a Christian. If you don't talk to him, then maybe you're not a Christian. If you don't let his word speak to you, then maybe you're not a Christian. If you don't desire him, then maybe you're not a Christian. Christian means little Christ, follower of the way, follower of Jesus. Let's commit together today. I'm going to be a person of encounter. I'm going to be a person of encounter. Mm, come on. I want to encounter him again today. Stretch out our hands. Shorkira Maratoya Shambaye from Batasi. Dakina Marati Yashoda. Come, Lord Jesus, manifest yourself here right now. I want to be a person of encounter. I want us to be a church of encounter. Blow afresh your spirit, your breath. Move across this room. When the music eventually starts again, there'll be no cameras and there'll be no anything else. Not quite yet. <laughs> there'll be no cameras. There'll be nothing else. There'll be no one looking at you. And it'll be you and God. And you will have an opportunity to come and encounter. And we've got about 10 minutes of worship. And so we want to see that done in that 10 minutes. We could make it go longer. It's not a big deal. But what I'm saying is, don't wait. If you want to be a person of encounter today, and you've waited, and you've not had an encounter for ages, then today, you can come and encounter. You can come and encounter. We've left room at the front here like we do every single week. If you fall over, fine. If you don't, then great. If you have a little laugh, wonderful. If you don't, then great. If you have a moment where you cry, then awesome. But if you don't, then great. None of that stuff matters. None of it matters. None of it. What matters is that you meet with him today. And so as we worship, Lord, I pray, build your throne. And show your throne. Lord, build your throne and show your throne. Lord God, would you come as we seek to encounter you afresh? In Jesus' name, amen.